Welcome back to the EV Life Podcast. I'm your host, Crystal Maharaj, and I'm joined by... I'm Alison Bench, the <laughs> producer of the EV Life Podcast. Was there some hesitation there? I, I don't know. Yeah, I felt like I should give myself like a really peppy intro or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm super happy to be here for today's episode. And um, I understand we're going to be talking to someone from the Pemina Institute. Yeah, so we're speaking to Adam Thorne, who is the director of the Pembina Institute's transportation program. He's also a public policy professor with expertise in environmental policy. Yeah, so I think this will be very interesting just because, you know, there's all these experts out there all across Canada Mm -hmm. at all these different universities doing all this research. And then the Pembina Institute kind of exists so they can all put their research towards a common cause, right? Yeah. So the Pembina Institute has been around since the 80s. So it's a Canadian not-for-profit think tank, and their focus is on energy transition. So just advocating for um, policy solutions and transition to alternative forms of energy. Hmm. Yeah. And, and that is, I feel like I'm sure these scientists have all been researching this for their whole careers, but in the lot, like now, I think this is so relevant to so many Canadians. And so I know in the past few years, I've definitely had more articles sent to me from the Pemina Institute and yes. more people are talking about it and I've seen it in the news. And so it, it was really important for us to kind of chat with them about wh- what they do, what the organization does and, and how they're going to be moving forward. Yeah. And so they release studies all the time on things like EVs and different types of energy solutions and policies. And so we talked to Adam Thorne, and I think we should just get right into that interview. And Adam shares a little bit of a recent study, and we'll link to that in the show notes. But enjoy my conversation with Adam. Hi, Adam. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about the Pembina Institute and what you do there? Absolutely. Uh, so the Pembina Institute is a clean energy think tank. Uh, what we do is try to help facilitate the transition to clean energy in Canada. Uh, we do this, of course, through research, advocacy, and convening. So the Institute works across uh, different areas of the energy transition. So, uh, for example, uh, helping to decarbonize the grid, uh, buildings, transportation, which provides us with a really sort of holistic view of Canada's energy system all the way from its production to its use. I am the director of the transportation program. Um, Our program is largely focused on decarbonizing or helping to decarbonize Canada's on-road transportation systems. Um, Our program focuses primarily on the medium and heavy-duty vehicle sector, but not exclusively. Okay. And when you say clean energy, what specifically are you talking about? We're talking about the decarbonization of our energy system. So moving to uh, both the production and the use of energy that is not going to release uh, greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So I understand that the Pembina Institute provides consultations to governments and other organizations, specifically on zero emission vehicles and other things as well. But can you tell us a little bit about the type of expertise you're able to share and why they specifically seek out the Pembina Institute? Yeah, and, and so I think they seek our input really for nonpartisan evidence-based analysis uh, that focuses on a realistic pathways to decarbonization. So we work pretty extensively with the industry. Uh, for example, our transportation program, we uh, lead a coalition called the Urban Delivery Solutions Initiative, which is made up of, of lots of different companies that participate in last mile urban delivery. So FedEx and Purilator and others. And we work with them to help them decarbonize that those last mile deliveries we really shift to electrification primarily or other modes of, of low carbon delivery and this is really sort of that 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 convening that I, I spoke about earlier and so um, by working with industry we can sort of develop a really deep understanding of their needs and we can then make recommendations that, that, that recognize those needs and, and provide those realistic pathways. So can you like share a little bit about some of the recent studies on zero emission vehicles that the Pembina Institute has been involved in and like specifically ones that might be of interest to our Alberta listeners? Actually, we're going to be releasing a, a report I'm really excited about. I apologize. This is not specifically about Alberta. Well, we are seeking to do this type of work in Alberta, but this is more of an Ontario focused one. But I do think it is, it is in fact, uh, really interesting will be applicable in the Alberta context. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called Power Boost. It's a study of the economic benefits to adopting electric school buses 
uh, in Ontario specifically, but again, uh, really the, the research and analysis is going to apply to, to lots of different regions in Canada. The uh, reason we're so excited about this report is that the school bus sector is really um, perfect for electrification. Uh, the way that school buses are used, uh, short routes, relatively predictable routes, the same route essentially every day. The fact that those buses then return back to the barn or the depot at the end of the day, giving them lots of time to, to charge overnight so they can be ready for the next day's deliveries. So they really suit electrification really well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are making the argument, well, a few arguments really, that the Ontario government, but of course also uh, other governments in, in Canada as well, uh, should really be supporting these vehicles. And there's lots of good reasons for these. Uh, or one is health. Um, there are about 20,000 school buses on the roads in Ontario, uh, most of which currently run on diesel. We know diesel exhaust is carcinogenic. We know it's particularly harmful to children mm -hmm. uh, who are susceptible to asthma and lung disease and other uh, other concerns. We know also that this has a really significant impact on healthcare costs. Uh, estimates suggest that diesel exhaust related health costs in Canada are, are something around $2.3 billion annually. So electrifying school buses obviously has a significant advantage in both reducing greenhouse gases, but also increasing health. Mm -hmm. What our report is really going to be focusing on is also the benefit they can provide to the economy Ontario. Um, the production of these vehicles uh, requires a significant supply chain. Uh, lots of small businesses that make the parts that go into the actual assembly of those vehicles. Uh, and our analysis has shown that if 65% of Ontario school bus stock is electrified by 2030, and the reason we come up with that number is that's currently Quebec's target for school bus electrification, okay. uh, it could create more than 13,000 jobs and generate nearly $2 billion in economic output in Ontario by 2030. Um, those jobs, of course, are really good jobs. They're manufacturing jobs. They don't often require degrees and they and they tend to pay quite well and have benefits. And so, you know, it, it, it's not just the economic benefit. It's not just the health benefit or the climate benefit. Right. Uh, the conversion to electric school buses has, has just all of these benefits tied up. And so we're really excited to, to make these recommendations to the Ontario government. And does the report also recommend how the government can help transition um, the buses over to electric vehicles? Absolutely. So the Ontario government plays a significant role in the funding of school buses. And so they can set targets for each of the school boards uh, uh, purchasing and supporting those vehicles. It can also uh, uh, support uh, capacity building through skills training, for example, uh, infrastructure. They can engage in um, really advocacy around this and ensuring that school boards are aware of these benefits and, and, and uh, aware uh, of particularly the benefits to children. I'm sure you're well aware that there's been a lot of debate over the federal government's mandate that all new vehicles sold in Canada by 2035 uh, must be zero emission. Do you think that this is a realistic deadline? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, 2035 is absolutely a, a, an achievable uh, um, uh, deadline, and I think there's a, a number of reasons why I say that. Uh, so first of all, we should recognize that a mandate has significant advantages. Uh, it can ensure supply of vehicles are available in, in, in uh, all across Canada. Right now, both British Columbia and Quebec already have a mandate in place, and I think very naturally manufacturers then um, are, are more likely to deliver vehicles to those provinces to ensure that they are, are meeting those those uh, uh, targets in those provinces. And so what we see is sort of an undersupply in other regions in Canada. A national mandate is going to help alleviate that problem so that all Canadians have access to those vehicles. Mm -hmm. It's also going to create certainty. Um, when you are or thinking about investing in charging infrastructure, for example, you want to be sure that those vehicles are going to be there, that they're going to be available, people are going to be purchasing them uh, so that they can come and use your charging infrastructure. And so this will help alleviate one of that key challenges uh, that we talk about when we talk about EVs is, is really the lack of charging infrastructure or, or the slower rollout of charging infrastructure than we'd like to see. And so Amanda can really help that. Obviously, uh, a mandate with those kind of targets will help reduce uh, emissions. They'll also accelerate a technology cost decline. Um, we know that economy scale uh, is really important when we're talking about manufacturing. And so the more vehicles that are being produced, we know that the cost of those vehicles will decline that much more rapidly. I should also point out that you know this is not um, a unique number of the Canadian government has committed to, to 100% by 2035. That is very similar. California has made the same commitment, 2035. 
um, 100% by 2035. And we know California is a, a larger market really than even Canada. Right. Many, many European countries have also made similar uh, commitments. And of course, um, many of the manufacturers are now making quite aggressive targets as well. I think GM quite recently announced that all of their lineup will be electric by 2035 as well. So I think that target is is very achievable. Right. And we also hear from a lot of people who are apprehensive about adopting EVs and other types of, you know, zero emission vehicles. Is there anything that you could maybe say to people to make them feel a little bit more at ease about the change? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's two things to, to, to I can really speak to. One is sort of the total cost of ownership or, or really the, the financial argument for these. We know that the vehicles can be a little more expensive right now uh, than, than a comparable internal combustion engine. Now, that will change. We know the prices are declining and then eventually we'll have cost parity. Uh, but right now, they still are a more expensive. But if you calculate the total cost of ownership over the period of which you own those vehicles, in fact, we can see that an electric vehicle provides significant saving. So mm -hmm. uh, they're much, uh, much cheaper to fuel uh, and, and require uh, significantly less maintenance. So there have been lots of good studies uh, comparing uh, two comparable vehicles and, and, and showing that there are significant savings over that period. The other thing I can say is that the ecosystem that, that supports these vehicles is rapidly evolving. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, 10 years ago when there were very uh, few of these vehicles on the road, uh, there were real challenges in terms of things like binding, uh, charging, uh, right. for example. That's beginning to change quite rapidly. Uh, we're seeing more charging roll out. We're seeing because companies like GM, of course, are investing significantly in these vehicles. They're beginning to invest in training for their dealerships and their technicians. Uh, they're beginning to take a real interest in charging. And so we're seeing them develop their own charging networks. Uh, we're beginning to see, you know, standardization of the charging ports. Uh, a number of companies in North America recently announced they were going to adopt Tesla's uh, um, charging port. And so, you know, that's really evidence of a, of a maturing industry. So I think that can give a lot of confidence to people who may have been considering EVs previously, but just been a little bit hesitant. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think there's a lot of reason here to be confident. And what do you have to say about people who say that our electric grid, our power grid can't sustain everyone owning an EV? I think that criticism would be more appropriate if we were all going to buy EVs tomorrow. Right. <laughs> well, we know <laughs> that there will be a much slower rollout, even if uh, those of us who who are you know very enthusiastic about the EV revolution, um, we know that this is going to take some time. Even with the sales mandate of 100% by 2035, there will still be many, many internal combustion engines on the road. Um, and, and so we know the demand for electricity is not going to be immediate or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have time uh, to both green our grid, to make it cleaner, to make sure that that grid is, is not emitting uh, greenhouse gases, um, but also to ensure that the supply and, of course, the distribution of the electricity is sufficient to meet the, the new demands. Well, when we look at the future of transportation, is there one thing that you're most excited for? So one, I, I mean, uh, again, as a person who studies transportation and as involved in this, it's really the change in the transportation system as a whole. I think we are you know, witnessing a once in a generation change here. I move away from internal combustion engines with all of the problems, greenhouse gases, uh, air pollution, for example, uh, that we know they cause to to a system that, that that's much cleaner. So we're looking at one that produces less carbon, and we're looking at one that is it, that is ultimately going to produce less air pollution. And I think that is incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say that on a, a on a sort of more micro level. Um, all of these companies that are beginning to now announce that their lineups are, are shifting to EVs means that we're going to have a lot of really new and exciting vehicles uh, that are entering the market quite soon. So I think that's really exciting as well. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. This was such a great conversation. Well, well thank you so much for this. I really appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Adam Thorne, who is the director of the Pembina Institute's transportation program. We'll link to that study that was referenced in the interview in the show notes. And if you'd like to join the conversation and chat with myself and Allison, make sure that you join the EV Life community on the AMA mobile app. Uh, we look forward to chatting with you there. And of course, subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen so that you never miss an episode. Episode. Talk to you next week.